Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for this opportunity to talk. And also, thank you, Ross. That was a, a great presentation. I very much enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to talk today, then, about um, um, what we've been doing over at the National Library for the past uh, couple of months um, and really kind of focus on this notion of, of what is what is this, this persistence in, in identifying formats. Um, so we're going to talk about what, what Rosetta. <clears throat> Rosetta is the tool that we use, is our, is our um, digital repository. And we're going to talk about that a little bit and talk about how Droid has changed and highlight some of the things which Ross has already identified for us um, and talk about a, a paper which I completed, um, discuss some of the results and then move on to some recommendations from that paper. Um, I probably didn't need to put this slide in because, um, of course, Ross has just uh, described what Pronum and Droid is for us, but here's a quick recap. Um, and also, perhaps there may be parts of this uh, talk which Maybe a bit technical or a bit, a bit kind of deeper, deeper knowledge than, than you might possibly need to have. Um, what I've done is I've cunningly placed images throughout the uh, presentation which just about relate to the slide they're on. So um, if the content isn't that interesting, what I'm talking about, perhaps the images, and you can try and figure out why I've used that particular image. Um, I'll give you a clue that that one's a registry and I'm talking about registries. It's that kind of level. It's not hard. Um, <clears throat> so there we go. We're going to talk about Pronom a little bit. It is um, um, uh, undoubtedly the most widely used format file registry um, in the digital preservation sector. Um, and Droid, um, which is the tool which has been described, describing, is the, the tool which identifies file type based on these pronoun records. They're both um, um, looked after by, by Ross and his team. Um, to answer Peter's question, um, Ross, in your current signature, which is 59, <laughs> you currently have 550-ish um, signature sets, and there are about 864 file types which are identified by extension. So there you go, Peter. Thanks for asking that question. We didn't set that up, by the way. Um, um, I do recommend, if, it's, if there's a topic of interest to you, then go and rummage around on the, on the um, National Archives website, and there's lots of good resources on there. Um, and this is a brief history of Rosetta. So it is our digital preservation repository. Um, <clears throat> it's been about four years since we um, started putting it together. Um, it was a little bit before my time. Um, and that came from a, a whole requirements um, gathering phase through to a, uh, a project which delivered um, some prototype um, and then first version, version one. Um, we've been out of project mode for about 18 months now. So it is a business as usual system. Um, you know, this is the mechanism that we use at the National Library to ingest content. Um, we've had about eight significant upgrades um, and software revisions. And so this just describes the change, the phases of change that we're going through um, as, we, as we develop and build and understand the capability. Um, this, this, this talk is kind of one of those things, if I'd have heard Jeff's presentation and Ross's presentation, I maybe would have changed things slightly because there's loads of really great points which are coming up. But change of the tools which we're using is one of the primary things. And actually, the March of Progress slide which Ross used, I think, is a really great example. We are all learning. We're all developing the knowledge that we have. And even in just the four years that we've been doing digital preservation um, you know, with, with some passion and with some, result, with some uh, resourcing, with some funding, um, and in the 18 months we've been doing it in anger as a business usual process, we learn almost every single day something new, something we might want to change, something which we thought six months ago would have been perfect and ideal, and actually it turns out maybe it might not be the best way of doing things. So we are all learning. Um, <clears throat> we currently have about six million digital objects um, in the repository to date. Um, so that's six million discrete things. Um, and as Rosetta is the backbone of the, of the um, GDAP program, which you'll hear more about throughout the conference, I'm sure, um, that number's only going to grow, and it's going to grow very, very quickly. And again, I think Ross indicated some of the um, um, speculative figures that they're anticipated to receive. It's exactly the same for us over here. There is tons of this stuff, and it is slowly reaching our borders of the, of the collecting institutions. Um, so I'm going to talk about what we do and how we use um, um, format identification inside um, Rosetta. We basically do what's called a worm process. We read it once when it comes in. This is how we currently work. We read it once when it comes in, and then, uh, and then we, sorry, we write it once when it comes in using the tools, and then we read it many times. So as part of our ingest routine, um, format identification is automatically undertaken, and we write a system record, which lives in the system, live with the object itself, and we write a database record, which is part of our live system. And we use this as a label. It's, part, it's a way of understanding what content we have. Um, so we kind of rely on this persistence of the signature to tell us what we've got in the repository so we can plan activity, so we can start to understand the preservation requirements, the preservation needs going forward, so we can understand actually what we've got our hands on. Um, and part of that's about understanding what we don't know as well. Part of it's about saying we need to understand these things about these objects um, because we can't accurately plan activities and understand what the resourcing implications are going forward. 
so why do we do that? Why do we actually get this file type stuff? And why, why um, as I was quoted as saying, is it the keys to the kingdom of, of preservation? Well, for Rosetta and for Rosetta users, um, <clears throat> it basically is the way that we steer objects and the way that we assign activities and behaviors and functions to that. And this diagram starts to understand that. So we have a digital object, a file, um, <clears throat> and it has a format file type. And that may, however we want to describe it, we currently use pronom. Um, but it can be anything. There's a number of other, other ways of doing it. And that format file type drives all these behaviors and functions within, within Rosetta. And I'm just going to quickly go through that list with you. The first one is access copy generation. And this is, is part of the conversation that, that Jeff was having this morning. It's a way of, of creating non-complex versions of complex items that we can share and share easily. They don't have to be a verbatim facsimile of the original Norton ones. Um, they're a accepted, close representation that people can understand um, and that is easier to share. One of the things which we do do, for example, with a lot of images is that we take TIFFs, high resolution, scan TIFF images, and we create an access copy of that, a JPEG and a JPEG 2000, which is much easier to share over the internet, and much easier to share via browsers, and are much more um, uh, um, uh, suitable for, for consumption for, for most people. It's not ideal for, for, for a number of researchers. It doesn't give you the fine minutia of some of the detail that you might expect from a high resolution scan, but for a lot of our uses, and this presentation is a great example, all the images I took were these low resolution um, versions of scans for using in presentations, for demonstrating a point, for giving somebody access to, to, to um, what is some, some, some heavy in digital terms content. We also use it to steer our uh, object delivery method as well. So how do we know what parts of the system we use to, to, to represent a video file or an image file? <clears throat> and we do that by tying up this, this um, uh, file format type. So we would say this is a this is a um, a video, for example. So therefore, when I go to play it, when I click on the show me the access copy, um, Rosetta will use some logic behind the scenes and go, I know you're a video because I know your file type, and I will use a function called the content aggregator and push that out as streamed video through the browser window. Um, the point is that the user doesn't need to know anything about that complex part of that file. It's very simple. The user goes, ah, oh, video, that looks cool. I'm going to press it. Sweet, some people doing stuff. You know, that's pretty much the level that we, we want to have. We want to make sure that people don't need to go, now, is that an AVI? Is that an MPEG-2 encoding? What codec was used to do that? Is my browser going to crash when I try and play it? Does it play in a browser? And all these complex questions. And what we're trying to do is make Rosetta the intelligent part of that conversation. The user, because the user is not usually a technical expert, they can enjoy the content and experience the content for whatever purpose they're viewing it for. Um, so the ones in green boxes, they're stuff we're doing today. That's about access. That's about making sure we can do things with objects today. There would be no point us ingesting terabytes of data if we then locked it away in a basement of the library and never allowed anybody access to it. What would be the point of that? Yep, we could look after the noughts and ones, but nobody would ever see them and know that we've even preserved those noughts and ones. So kind of what's the point? So the, greens is, the, the green boxes are things we're doing today. Um, digital object characterization, risk association, and metadata extraction, kind of bridging preservation functions and access functions. The object characterization is a method of understanding. It's the using of Droid and other tools to identify what we have. Risk association is saying, with this particular format, we think it's at risk because of risk A, risk B, risk C. So for example, we have some WordStar files which we're currently looking at. Um, you can't get WordStar for a modern PC. Um, so how do, we, how do we make sure that we can access that content? We flag there's a risk across this format. So when we ingest objects with this format, the Rosetta system says, hey, you've got some stuff and it's got a risk on it. You might want to do something with that. So that's the risk association function. How do we tie risks to objects? And metadata extraction is another mechanism we use to actually pull out significant properties, technical properties, and any other um, um, instructional functions which are, are locked up inside those file formats. Um, we currently use Jove, uh, at the Jove tool to do this. And we use the New Zealand um, uh, Libraries metadata extraction tool. And then the final ones there are preservation set creation and risk indication. These are the two things. These are the preservation actions. This is the thing that we're actually doing. This is what we're planning towards. How do we know that we've got all of the TIFFs and all those TIFFs are the right sort of TIFFs, TIFF version whatever, or JPEG version whatever, that we know is at risk and that we know we need to take some action with? It's by creating these preservation sets. And that's through understanding what file formats that we have. Risk indication is the process I described a second ago. So we associate the risks and the risk identification is Rosetta saying, hey, you've ingested these WordStar files. You want to have a look at them because I can't do anything sensible with them for you right now. 
This is a brief overview of Rosetta. <clears throat> And I'm not really going to go into too many of the functions on this one. Um, you can see the arrows coming in from the side. This tells us um, all of the ingest routes, all of the ways we get content coming in. It's varied. It's wide. We have very little control, particularly over the web deposit function, where anybody, anybody can log in, become a depositor, and submit information, submit content for the library, um, and we would appraise it for, for collecting. Once it comes into the deposit UI, we go through the validation stack, which is where we do this, this process. It's not the only thing we do there. We do, obviously, virus checking. We do some fixity checking. But in this validation stage is where we need to know exactly what that file is and do something with it. All the stages thereafter um, excuse me, start to describe some of the things which Jeff was talking about. <clears throat> they describe how we are creating access copies, how we are trying to understand what our set looks like, how we are trying to learn from the, the repository content. Um, but my job today is to talk more about this validation kind of area. Um, but it's fundamental. Without that, we wouldn't know what we have in the repository. So it's a real primary process. And we currently use Droid to do that as, as a part of Rosetta. So here's the thing. I was trying, thinking, how, how could I explain Rosetta and what we think about uh, a droid and what we think about what we're doing with droid? Um, and I sat down with Peter, and the fact that he's just had a baby um, has probably got nothing to do with me using a child's toy as the, as the best analogy I could come up with. Um, but what we, were, what we were starting to think of was actually, there is actually something quite nice in this analogy. So what we're trying to say here is that the area inside the box is Rosetta. Um, so that the space inside there is putting, putting content somewhere safe, somewhere manageable. We know where it is. We know what it is, and it's safe and locked up. Each block is a digital object, so it's different files, it's word files, it's video files, it's audio files, whatever. Um, and each shape is its, own, is its own particular format. And the sorter, the kind of funny shaped cut out wooden pieces, um, that's essentially what we use Droid for. And we're using it, we're using it as, a, as a very technical filtering to allow us to start building piles of objects that are very, very, very similar to each other, so we have some degree of confidence when we go into the future to be able to um, process them in an equal way, um, so we get less exceptions, but also so we can steer their behaviors today, so we can create access copies, and so we can do appropriate metadata extraction. So this is the analogy that I'm kind of going with. Work with me if it doesn't work with you. Um, it kind of it sticks just about. Um, <clears throat> and this is the process that we take. So we make a record of every shape as it enters, um, of, of the digital object as it enters the box. So we might say, for example, there's the triangle on the floor there. Um, this triangle shape, we get, I've got one of these triangles, awesome, and we keep a log of that in the system. Um, these, this record is used to trigger these activities I've been describing, access copy generation, set creation, those kinds of things. Um, but what we're also wanting to be sure of is that I can actually go back and find that triangle and take it back out through the same hole. If that triangle hole is no longer there, it's going to be difficult for me to get that object back out again. And I'm going to come back to that analogy in a second as to why that's important. So the expectations are these. We expect that the sorter never changes. This is an expectation. Um, this kind of leads to my point. We want to put things in. We need to be able to take them back out again. If I put in all my office documents and the, the, the sorter changes and says we no longer consider them office documents anymore, they're something different, I have a problem because I have a bunch of things in my repository which no longer have a reference point coming out again. I don't know what to do with them. So I need a mechanism which says, hey, the shapes have changed and we need to do something with it. So the expectation is the sorter should never change. Things go in, they can come out by the same mechanism. And the blocks also never change. That stands to reason. Our job as a, as a collecting institution, as a memory institution, is to preserve the blocks, is to preserve those objects as they come in. Um, if we were to go about changing them willy-nilly, changing the shapes into tri uh, the squares into triangles, we're probably not doing our job properly. Um, this is kind of the point I was making a second ago. A digital object placed in the box yesterday will be the same shape tomorrow. Um, there's a consistency. The use of persistence as a, as a word um, infers there's a consistency in that, in, that, in, that, in that object and the functions that we're doing. So if I place a, 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 an office file into um, my sorter today, I would expect it to be an office file when I put it in that sorter in six months' time, in a year's time, in five years' time, accepting that there will be some change, but this is the kind of model that we're building. Um, and the same goes for extracting it as well. I expect that this object can come out again by the same mechanism. If I don't use consistent and persistent labels, it gets very difficult to understand what those things are, particularly when we're talking about large volumes of objects. The reality is that, obviously, things change. Um, Droid has undergone two major revisions. Um, so we have installed in Rosetta. We started off with one version. We've gone to another one. 
Um, and there's an, a, another version of Droid kind of we are currently testing, and, and, and Ross has already mentioned there's a, another version on the way, which is great. Um, um, TNA um, very cunningly came up with the, the um, container signatures, which are a fantastic inclusion in the mechanism that we have, and they are such a great tool. They're incredibly powerful, and we as a community are only just starting to understand how valuable these things are, but uh, my money's on them being one of the things which we use an awful lot more in the future. Um, and since we've released Rosetta, of version one, we've seen that there's been 406 new formats, and we've seen there's been 600 changes to signatures. Now, this is a good thing, don't get me wrong. Things need to change, we learn more, and I, and I said earlier that we are all learning as a community. We know that we get things wrong, we know that we make assumptions which may not be correct, that may not stand the test of time. Things have to change. So there has to be some leverage here, there has to be some um, capability for us all to have conversation and communicate and understand what that change means and understand the implications for, for people using tools um, when changes do occur. And those changes are important and they must happen. So, um, as I said, Rosetta has used Droid version 3. We're currently running Droid version 5. Um, and uh, Droid version 6 is just on the way, and we're currently testing it. Um, we've also used a number of different signature versions. And again, without going into the complexities of what goes on with signatures, um, these are those updates that we get frequently and periodically, which tell us kind of these are new signatures and these are signature changes. There's also a proposal by the um, Rosetta um, vendor, Ex Libris, that there's a new method inside Droid called the max byte scanning function, um, and that that was proposed to be deployed as a, as a um, standard mechanism inside Rosetta. Now, again, I'm not going to bore you with the technical details, but this does fundamentally change how Droid works. And it's one of these things. It saves an awful lot of, efficient, of time. There's an efficiency gain in computational time for doing, the, um, for, file, for doing the file identifications. But the question we were asking was, at what cost? Is there a cost in terms of the accuracy of the signature? So we started asking some questions of ourselves. Is this a change that we would be supporting? Is this a change even beneficial? Would it help us? Would it hinder us? Is it going to change the shape of the sorter if we deployed that? And we couldn't find any research or any papers which told us um, that that would actually be a good, bad, or indifferent thing to do. So we set out down the road of, I set out down the road of doing some, some testing. Um, and it started off as quite a small basic, basic experiment. Um, <clears throat> but over time, it kind of grew, because we realized that there's an awful lot of parts of this conversation which we're not really having as a community. So I created a source set, and I took 26,000 digital objects, um, which was just, over six, just under six, uh, 600 gig of, of, of content. And it spans 61 format types. So it's not all of the formats that we currently have in our repository, um, but it spans a good percentage of them. Um, some of them I was able to get five, 500 um, versions of the files or, or different um, objects of a certain file type. And some I could only get one or two. So you know the, resu the results are varied. And I tested Droid 3, Droid 5, Droid 6, and Droid 6 fast mode, which is this max byte scanning function. Um, and I also tested with or without signatures. Uh, sorry, with or without file extensions. Um, so Droid also has a, a function. If it doesn't have a pattern, it will revert to the signature. And we wanted to know what that difference, what that difference meant. How does it change how we understand the world of files? So <clears throat> I took about a million, a million uh, lines of log code from, from uh, the Droid uh, version that I was running. And every single iteration of Droid that I ran um, took about a day, a day and a half to go through, to churn through those, those files. So it took me a while to even build my, my, my collection set. And I used Python and MySQL to sort through, clean, and filter, and draw graphics, and otherwise interpret that result, because I was basically looking at um, a million lines of things saying, I think I'm this file, I think I'm this file. And it was, it was kind of complicated. Um, I pretty much completed a paper, and it's currently going through my internal review process. Um, I hoped it was, uh, would be available today, but I'm, I'm just waiting for that to be signed off. As soon as it is, that's going to go out onto the Open Planets Foundation website, because it's all about community, and it's all about discussion. And that's one of the, the biggest things I picked up from, from Ross's talk, is this is all about communication. Uh, uh, all about communicating within a community. We're all in this together, we're all doing the same jobs, and it's all about us sharing. So this is a summary of some of the results that I found. Um, <clears throat> of those 61 tests, that are the types I tested, 75% performed identically across all versions of Droid and all signature versions. And this is great. This is consistency. This is exactly what we're looking to see. We're seeing that we put the file in today, um, and I went back through time by using version 3 and signature version 13. That's essentially like going back through time, and they're performing in exactly the same way. So this is great. This is a really, really good result. Um, of those, 40% um, performed consistently, um, offering a single PUID, um, which is a single file type, um, across the range of tests. And this is the absolute ideal, best case scenario for us when it comes to, to signature matching. We can say, awesome, this thing is here, it's consistent, and, and through all of time that we've understood this process, it's doing the same thing, and this is a really good thing. But of course, 
that's 40%. Those 60% do some other things. Some of those other things, we found that 26% of file types offer a multiple PUID for a single file at various occasions. This is a complexity, and, it, and, it, and it's an interesting nuance of the Pronom data set, um, where, it, where Droid is able to say, you are either PUID A, B, C, or D. And I don't actually know what that is. Um, but these are the ones you could be. And TIFF is a particular example. This has subsequently been resolved in signature version 52 off the top of my head. Um, a, new PUID, a new PUID was created, um, FMT353. I'm a bit of a format nerd. Um, and um, so now we do have a single PUID for that. So going forward, it's great. We've got the single PUID, the single identification for this file type. But we also now have a legacy of data which says, there's some ambiguity around the result I can give you. And our question as a library is, how do we deal with that? How do we implement these changes? Um, and the other thing was that Droid Fast does do some changes, and this was quite problematic and a little bit concerning. Um, Droid, Droid Fa uh, 6 in fast mode, um, by extension, it was affecting EPUBs, some MP4 files, FLAC, WAV, ZIP, and some of the PDFs and other files. Um, so this was really, really interesting, and it, and it allows us to, to make some decisions and to do some planning and to understand what that tool is. As I said, there's an expectation of consistency. We would expect that the Droid Fast mode works transparently to the Droid Standard mode. It turns out it doesn't always do that, according to the results we found. So um, that's a really, really interesting thing. Um, so there's some recommendations, and there's that word again, community. Um, there is a clear need for the community to own a data set that spans the Pronom catalog and support testing. I'm not suggesting for a second that Ross and his beleaguered colleagues actually undertake that. It would be a Herculean task, and it would be almost impossible um, without a significant chunk of funding. It's about all of us. It's about all of us collecting institutions who are doing this job and doing it well to get together, to talk regularly, to communicate, and to help each other, because we're all doing the same job. I really recommend that somebody else redoes this work. It was really, really interesting. It was really, really eye-opening. Um, and with any, any research and any experimentation, which I guess is level five of, um, of what Ross was talking about, you know, you need to get peer review. You need to get other people to look at what you're doing and make sure it's correct. And you need to get people to repeat what those findings are. So I have an open door to all of the tools, all of the scripts that I wrote to undertake this. <clears throat> They're a bit shabby. I'm not really a coder, um, but they work. Um, and it's an open door. If, if, you know, if somebody wants to undertake this piece of work, I will happily help anybody to go through the same process. It was painful, um, but I got there in the end. And I'm really happy to share that with anybody. <clears throat> And finally, given the variances on the Droid Fast mode, um, you know, there is a suggestion or a question that perhaps we should be doing some other testing um, inside the community to, uh, and to, to maintain consistency with leg legacy signatures and what those impacts are. Change is necessary, change is important, change will always happen. The question is, is how do we deal with the impact of that change? Is it better to always implement the change at the first time we see it, or should we sit down as a community of stakeholders and discuss what's going on to make sure we fully understand the implications for those changes we're meeting? Uh, we're, we're planning to make. So to recap, we've had a quick look at how uh, Rosetta uses Droid. Um, I've talked about some of the things, how Droid has changed and how it's changed for us. And I've described some of the research which we undertake it. We've discussed those results and those recommendations. And that is my time. So thank you very much. There is a Rosetta demo um, uh, on Wednesday if you want to come and see a bit more about the, the inner workings of that, of that process. Um, and it's an open invite. Anybody's uh, you know, more than welcome to come along. And as I say, keep your eye out on the Open Planets Foundation mainly for conversations around this stuff, not just for my paper, but it will be awesome when it's up there. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>